morning, everyone. Welcome to the top of the hill on the Angeles Forest. Uh, today promises to be one of the hottest days of the year. Uh, it is not even 8 in the morning, and it's 86 degrees outside. It's going to be a hot one. Uh, uh, by the time it gets to be like 10 or 10.30, it's going to be like 105 degrees up here. Good test for the all-new, uh, well, all-new as of last year, 2021 Mercedes AMG GLA 45, or is it GLA 45? GLA 45 AMG. It's a Mercedes AMG when it's the GT. When it's a regular car, it's Mercedes GLA 45 AMG. Uh, second generation car. I liked the first generation car better than the CLA 45 for our European uh, followers. We don't get the regular A45 hatchback here. Uh, if you want uh, a hatchback here, uh, as we now know in America, you gotta lift it, put big wheels on it. That's, that's how you sell hatchbacks uh, in America. Um, fortunately, you know, Mercedes also knows what sells an AMG car, and that is a hand-built, uh, you know, firecracker of a motor, and this thing has got it. It's a two-liter, uh, uh, four-cylinder engine, M139 is the code. It is uh, a 382 horsepower, 354 pound-feet of torque. Uh, it's got a twin-scroll turbo uh, mounted behind the engine, between the engine and the firewall. And that's mated to an eight-speed dual clutch gearbox with torque vectoring all-wheel drive. There's a clutch pack that controls uh, how much power is sent to the back, and then there's a torque vectoring rear differential uh, that can send torque to one side or the other. Um, the the engine itself has an AMG specific block and head, hand assembled by one person, as uh, AMG engines are the re the real deal ones. Um, and the, that turbo behind the block thing and the intake side being in the front, that's inversed from the, uh, the GLA 35, the lesser version of, uh, of this thing. Uh, this one has uh, an option that I would strongly recommend, the AMG Dynamic Plus Pack, which gives you the adaptive dampers, six piston front brakes instead of four pistons, and then all these different uh, drive modes quickly selectable from the steering wheel, plus very interestingly named traction control settings like Pro and Master. We're on Master right now. Um, there's also a basic track telemetry program to record your laps and your favorite tracks. can help you improve. Uh, this thing weighs about 3,600 pounds. It has a base price of 55,000, but because this one is really loaded up with options, it's, uh, it's 68,000. Um, you could skip some of the stuff that this one has, but not that dynamic uh, plus pack. Um, 0 to 60 in 3.9, quarter mile in 12.4 on the way to a top speed of 155 miles an hour. And we'll get back to some of the things in the notebook that I'm not a fan of after we drive. So fortunately, I've taken the liberty of setting my individual mode, which is the full dynamic powertrain, uh, uh, dynamic gearbox setting. It's easy to set. As soon as you click it, it shows you, boom, you can hit one button and set it. The Oh, we're in pro. We need to be in master. I need to do drive, dynamic, transmission, manual, dynamics, which is your traction control, master. Suspension, comfort, because even in the canyons, we don't need it stiff. And exhaust system, we have a control of balanced or powerful. That means loud and quiet, and we're going to go with loud. That's how I have my individual mode settings. Let's see if they're good. And you know what? I was going to flip around, but we could just actually, we could probably start by doing a launch. I think, can I just like release brake? Good dump there. Nice, easy launch control. No additional setup required. Matte brake, matte throttle, and go. 
Folks, today's video is brought to you by my favorite grooming tool of all time, the Brio Beardscape and its new cousin, the Blackout Beardscape in full murder regalia. This thing rules. It's got a crazy long battery life with like three hours of trimming power. I literally charge my Beardscape about once a year. Plus, it's got the battery display, the power display, it's got adjustable length, uh, blades so you can get real tight you can get a little looser with it and if you want to go crazy you can pop this main blade right off as I learn I should clean the inside of it and use the zero blade that's for trimming it's for edging it's for getting that hard cut it's not for your bolas I would not use it on your bolas. Whether you're shaving your beard, your head, or your body, the Beardscape lets you do all of it at home quickly, efficiently, and with tons of battery power to spare. Hit the link in the description to get the Beardscape, either in the regular color or the new blackout color, with the zero blade accessory, and never pay for a barber again. What I really liked about the last GLA 45 was that it was like a semi-luxurious rally car, kind of like the Porsche Macan. Um, although being a transverse turbo four-cylinder engine, um, it's obviously more in the spirit of traditional rally cars, uh, economy car roots, as it were. And in fact, this thing, you know, I, I think it's a hatchback. They call it a compact crossover. The only difference is the roof is a little taller, the ride height has a little more travel to it, and they make the body fit 21-inch wheels. In every other way, this really feels like a hatchback to me, but it's got a lot of suspension travel, which I like for a multitude of reasons. I like suspensions to suspend. I like the car to be able to move around so that the suspension can maintain its contact patch. I don't want the car skipping across rough pavement because the shock is too stiff. Also, I live in Venice Beach, California. The tarmac is garbage. So having some suspension travel, some ride quality, some cushiness, you know, in the city where I live, it's closer to off-roading than it is to Autobahn driving. Oh, that was a fox just ran across the road. On that scale of Autobahn to off-road, my hometown is more off-road than Autobahn, straight up. Uh, and up here, even on the crest, it's a bumpy road. I don't need the extra stiffness of the Sport Plus suspension. So I like having the GLA versus the CLA because it's smoother. Is fast. <laughs> let's let's not let's not kid ourselves here. This is a really quick car. Um, when you're driving it around town, you don't want to use comfort mode. You want to use one of the more high performance engine modes, and that's so it doesn't lug in sort of an economy tune, right? Because it doesn't make any power until 3,000. It has no problem staying above 3,000. But that's that's kind of where you want to keep it. Yes, it's a little a little four cylinder buzzy, but it's it's I think I'm just about as refined as one of these engines is gonna get. On the highway, you can throw it into comfort mode to get it up to eighth gear. Once you're cruising, you know it's fine. It's quiet and comfortable at that comfort mode highway pace. And then if you you know, jam the throttle, it skips ships. It'll drop straight from eighth to sixth or fifth, and that's good. That's refined. That's a good choice. And speaking of gearbox, one of the weak points uh, in the past for me was the gearbox of this car. The, the first gen dual clutch uh, was, I believe I called it mushy. Uh, in the quest for smoothness, it would engage the gears in what I'd call a mushy way. Whereas Porsche is precise and crisp, right? You, what you really, you don't want smooth, you want crisp. And smooth is a function of how well you do crisp uh, and how well you can match those speeds, right? The second generation gearbox here, the eight speed, is really good. Whether you're in automatic mode or manual mode, 
Um, it chooses gears better. It hunts for gears less. Um, the different drive modes really do make a difference in how gears are selected. Uh, and when you switch to manual mode, it's responsive. Uh, on the way down, you have to leave a little more room than you might think for the gear change. As long as you mentally know that, um, you are I mean, really, really good to go. Listen. And it gives you that... If this was a Volkswagen, you might call it the fart. Um, but I actually think it sounds better here than Volkswagen's farting. I think the Volkswagen fart is not great. This one, and there's just, just this tiny hint of a burble tune. Burble tune, I think I declared over earlier this year, and I'll stand by that, but there's just a, a very slight burble tune exemption for rally type vehicles, I think. And listen, listen. I love the, on the way up, the flat foot upshifts, because it cuts the spark, and then it just combusts a little bit of fuel in the uh, exhaust. The steering, pretty direct, sharp, um, communicative, I can adjust mid-corner, uh, it's responsive to weight transfer when I load up the nose here, and trail brake, uh, and I lift off the brake, sort of at the apex of the corner, I'm able to feel that in the steering, which is really nice. If I said it's fast, it's really fast. And we're up at about 4,000 feet elevation here on a hot day. Temps are good. Brakes are good. Third and fourth gear is really your sweet spot. You know, peak torque is like 4,700 and peak power is 6,500, but that's a little misleading because you get you get real usable power starting at around 335, so you don't have to keep it that high, but with the dual clutch and the ease of changing gears, third and fourth are very well spaced for a canyon drive. Shift lights on the gauge cluster, that's good. Mm. Now, uh, oh, the brakes, still very effective. I'm impressed with the brakes. I don't think this thing needs 21 inch wheels. Um, it has Yokohama tires on it, which I don't have a lot of experience with. They seem fine. But I don't think 21s are doing a service to this thing. Downsizing an inch uh, would probably be the way to go for me. Mm. Lots of grip, though. It's fun! <laughs> like, I don't care if it is a compact crossover or whatever instead of a true hot hatch. Like, it's... I had a Focus RS, and I don't, it's not like my Focus RS was that much more fun than this. It was certainly less comfortable. This thing is fun, it's ripping. It makes a really nice, pleasant sound. Uh, I like how you can modulate the brake pedal very well. I mean, if I had to run up and down this hill every single day, carry some things, this would be on my list. The fuel economy is not great for a hatchback, but it's like a almost 400 horsepower hatchback that relies on boost to go anywhere. I mean, that was going to happen. That's called inevitability. Uh, the visibility is good. There's front and rear cameras as well. Although, strangely, the front camera, it might be a setting I just can't figure out, but the front camera has a tendency to just come on when I stop at, like, a traffic light. Um, in my Mach-E, the front camera comes on when you get close enough to things to trigger the parking sensors, right? And it helps you get closer to things to park, right? That seems like a pretty useful feature. But in this, it just comes up when you stop. I can't figure out why that is. Maybe it's a setting. There's a lot of settings in this car. It would take me a long time to figure out all of them. Um, so that's a weird one. Other thing I really am not a fan of in this car, the seats. Uh, Mercedes has a habit of making 
extremely, extremely good seats. Uh, we're following this Camry, but we're going to stop here in a second. Uh, Mercedes makes some of the best seats in the business, if not the best seats in the business. And these are not Mercedes quality seats, or not not the kind of seats, quality seats I would I would want if I was shopping for a Mercedes. Um, this thing is. Uh, it, you can really feel its economy car roots in certain places. How can I help? Um, well, I guess if you say the name of the car enough, the voice activation thinks you want something. And that's that's fair. It didn't come up in the, in the interim. Um, yeah, these seats look like they have a lot of lateral uh, bolstering, but in practice, I'm actually really hanging on to the wheel a lot. Uh, and also, the seat bottoms are not all that big. They have this slide out thigh bolster thing, but there's not any real side bolstering. And listen, this thing can handle. It can really handle. You could pull some G's in this car and the seats don't, they don't really hold you that well. So, so there's, there's that. Uh, what else have I written down about anything? Have I missed? No, that's really it. That's what I've got. Um, 55000 to get into one, 68000 as tested. Uh, I would skip the wing and the dive planes in the front. We don't need that. Uh, I would skip the 21-inch wheels if we can get a smaller wheel than that. I might skip the two-tone interior. Get this thing to around sixty grand. You want the dynamic performance because that's what makes it really feel like an AMG, the adaptive suspension, the good brakes, the adjustability. Y you want those things, and you'd probably get half that money back on the resale because the next person's going to want those things too. Um, so thank you to Mercedes for letting me have a go. It's a really fun little car. If you can swing it and the gas diff, the price of gas doesn't bother you, the fuel economy, the GLC 63 does feel like a much higher quality product, not only because it's got the V8, but it's got the proper AMG seats. It's got a little bit nicer materials. Uh, it's got that sound. It's about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 more. That's not nothing. That's a lot, but it, it is a noticeable improvement in quality. On the other hand, if you have loved your STI or your Evo or your hot hatch or your import, your Golf R, and you want something that's a little bigger, rides a little better, um, and, and is really among the pinnacles of factory hot hatch tuning that we've really ever seen, uh, the GLA 45 rocks. I mean, the powertrain is amazing. The gearbox is really good. The engine's hot. It's fizzy. It's fun. And so to that end, it's very successful. So thank you to Mercedes for letting me have a go for a week. Thank you to you guys for watching, and I'll see you later. And remember, always fight your tickets. Use code TST10 on the Off the Record app available in the Android and iOS store, or go to offtherecord.com slash TST.